Well, turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6 is where we're going to start this morning. Good morning. <laughs> you know, we're in this really special time of prayer and fasting. It's a powerful season, and, and I hope you can sense this is how God does things. He's always present. He's always moving. He's always faithful to his word. The Bible says his mercies are new every morning. There's nowhere you can go to get away from his presence. But there are times and seasons in the culture of God, in the economy of God. There are cycles and seasons and ways that he does things. And when he is doing things, you want to get on board with where he's at. When he's speaking, you want to know what he's speaking. Well, isn't he speaking the whole Bible all the time? Well, yeah, but if he tried to speak the whole Bible, all the pages of the Bible to you all the time, would you be confused? You'd be like, what, what do I do? It's, it's like my kids. I tell them, if I tell them to do five chores, what are they going to do? They might not do any of them. Wait, what did you say? They're so lost. So what do I do? I just give them one thing at a time. This is what I want you to do right now. This is what I want you to focus on. God's a, a great leader. How many of you trust his leadership? So we're in a season of his leadership. We're always in a season of his leadership, but in this season of his leadership, we're focusing on very specific things. And in this time right now, this season of prayer and fasting, I hope you can sense that it's a special time. You know, we were, uh, how many of you came to prayer Wednesday night? Wednesday night prayer. All right. I want to encourage, there should be more hands raised. And I know some of you can't, maybe you work, maybe just life situations, but make it a priority to be here. Because prayer is, prayer is how things get done in the house of God. Prayer is how things happen in the kingdom of God. It just is. In fact, the defining feature of the bride, the body, is that we would be a house built up of living stones. Not, not a house as in the four walls of this building, people that gather here at this location. But we would be a house, this inside of you and inside of you, all bricks and stones inside of this house of us that we would be a house of prayer. How do you get known for something? We, we talked about this on a Wednesday night. How do you get known for something? How do you become famous for something? How did LeBron James become famous for playing basketball? Getting good at one thing, right? Being really, really skilled at something and getting good at it. And the body of Christ is supposed to be really skilled and get really good at connecting with the heart of God in the place of prayer. I'll, there's a, we'll get into this. There's a lot of assumptions about prayer, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning is prayer because that's the season that we're in, but it's not how we start. It's how we finish. Jeff and I were talking about, and we've see, you see this as leaders. You see this in your businesses. You see it with your family. It's easy to start something well, and then it just kind of trails off. A lot of times, the first prayer meeting is really, really great. Everybody's excited, and then about week two, everybody's really tired. Maybe you haven't eaten as much. Maybe you're not eating the things that you're used to. How many have been a little bit tired this last week? Or maybe you're out of your normal rhythm. And it just gets a little like, and you're, you're bumping up against the obstacles of your own flesh. You're bumping up against, maybe you, maybe you slipped a little and, and failed, and you want to quit. And you're bumping up against that. And I don't want to go on Wednesday nights and be with everybody else who's excited about prayer if I'm failing. Right? Anybody with me? You know what I'm talking about? Some of you barely made it here this morning. And, and I've had mornings like that with my wife and my, my kids. We, we barely get there because of what's going on. And then there's this sense of, I, oh, everybody's better than me. I ain't want to be here. Anybody? There might be one or two. The rest of you are doing awesome. <laughs> but we want to start well. We want to start in orchestra with the spirit, but we want to we want to keep doing it. We want to press past our own weaknesses, our own sense of failure. What are other people doing? What are other people? Where am I? We want to press through it, and we want to end well. We want to go all the way through this thing. We want to show up and keep showing up, not just here corporately, but you want to show up in your prayer closet. The house of God is supposed to be a house of prayer, and to be a house of prayer, each and every single one of us has to be really skilled and grow in this thing called prayer. Now, on a scale of 1 to 10, 
Not everybody in here is in the same place. If a one is I'm brand new to this, I really don't know how to pray. It's kind of boring to me. I'm a little intimidated by prayer, and I don't do it a whole lot. Maybe when we eat, we join hands and pray. I say a quick prayer if I'm in a lot of trouble or if I want something. But I, I, I don't really understand how to do it, and I'm not really good at it. There's other people that get up on the mic or I go to a, a prayer meeting. There's people that seem to just be able to do it really well, and I'm a little intimidated. And then there's those who just are like, when's the next prayer meeting? I want to pray all the time. And they get excited about praying for hours and hours and hours. And when they pray, it's like, oh, my gosh, things are happening. And maybe you've been doing this for a really long time, and prayer is something you love. Wherever you're at in this room, can we just agree right now, one, it doesn't matter because in the, in the scheme of eternity, if you're at a 10 or if you're at a 1, we're like two turtles that have just left the starting line and one's an inch in front of the other. Right? In the vastness of the transcendent, uncreative God with all of his wisdom and knowledge and his ways that are way beyond us, we're like right here together. All right? How many of you fathers berate and belittle your two-year-old because they haven't figured out how to use a spoon yet? Who does that? No. All right, so let's encourage one another. And if you're a one, or maybe you're like, I don't even know if I'm a one. I'm, I'm, this is my first time here. I've never even been in a church before. If you're at this, let's do this together. Let's grow. If you're a one, let's get to a two. This morning, grab a hold of something. Grab a hold of one nugget and get to a two. If you're a nine, let's get to a 10. Let's, let's keep going into this thing because it doesn't stop. You don't, get, you don't graduate from the school of prayer. It's a school that just keeps going and it gets better and it gets better. So let's grow together in prayer and in the revelation of prayer. I'm going to talk about this morning some of the obstacles, the difficulties. Why does prayer seem hard? Some wrong mindsets about prayer. We're going to look at what Jesus taught and preached about prayer. And uh, I'm calling this this morning a practical guide to prayer. And what I mean by that is not so much corporate prayer. There is corporate prayer, but I'm going to talk more. We're going to lean more towards personal prayer. It's your life of prayer with God. Okay, this is what I'm going to address this morning. It's a critical time because you might be in a place like, man, I want to get on board with what's happening in this spiritual family, but I'm not quite sure where I fit or how to do it. I don't feel successful in this thing. I want to I be where everybody else is at. Let's all get on the same page around the Word of God. And the Word, the revelation of the Word of God will unify us. I, this whole thing this is a big theme in my family this, this year is unity. And there's a false concept of unity that if we all will say the same thing, then we're in unity. If I can get you to say what I'm saying, then we're in unity. If we could all just use the same language and have the same common goal, then we're in unity. Well, lemmings are in unity over the side of a cliff. Is that God's idea of unity? What we learned a long time ago is if we will all, with our different gifts and personalities, and we annoy each other and confuse each other and and all of our weaknesses and strengths and our comparisons, if we will all just start hearing the voice of God and agreeing with God and agreeing with his word, then he will put us into unity. Did you know that? You don't have to try to be in unity with your spouse by just trying to get on the same page. with Now it helps to communicate. Honey, I didn't know you needed the car this morning. Well, I do need the car. Why didn't you tell me that last night? A little bit of communication helps work out the kinks. But unity comes, the best, the best years that I've had with my, my wife is when we've had breakthrough in prayer, breakthrough in intimacy with God, and we've just been looking at him together, and all of a sudden, like, it's like, man, I just, I love you. There's just, I, I was really annoyed with you last year. <laughs> this year, you're amazing. <laughs> and that she, you know, if you all know my wife. You'd be upset with me if I told you I was annoyed with her. But you'd totally get it if she was annoyed with me. So, Matthew chapter 6. Let's dive into the word. First, I want to look at what Jesus 
had to say. Jesus, Hebrews chapter 1 says, is the exact representation of the Father. In fact, he is the radiance of God's glory. He is what we can interact with. You know, you can't look at very long or interact with the sun. You're going to burn up. You'll go blind. But you can see and benefit from and interact with the rays of the sun. The radiance that comes off of the sun, the warmth, the light, is what benefits us. But if you try to interact with the sun itself, now that breaks down because Jesus is God. I'm not saying that they're two different. What I'm saying is that Jesus is the radiance. He's the manifestation and full expression of the Godhead bodily, and he's who we interact with. It's how we can see what God is like. When we see the life of Jesus, we see what the Father is like. Jesus told his disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The way I am with you is how the Father wants to be with you. And so we want to know what Jesus has to say about things. Jesus gives us the most concise and the most clear description of the things that are the most important to the Father's heart. So we're going to start here in Matthew 6, verse 5. Jesus teaches about prayer. And this is in context of lots of other pieces of teaching He probably preached this once as a whole, but many times in parts and pieces. He probably preached this sermon many times. He traveled all over. They didn't have tape or CD or live streaming ministries back then. So you preach it in one town, then you go to the next, and you preach it in that town. A lot of people think Jesus just went up on a mountain. He preached this one time. No, he probably preached this over and over and parts of it in different places. Okay, But here we have a compilation of... The entire sermon. So he says about prayer, verse 5. And when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they receive their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will, will reward you. When you pray, don't Keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, I read that as a whole. A lot of times we just read the Lord's Prayer. I read that as a whole because I want to talk about the whole thing. So I have six points I want to make here on this, just in the Sermon on the Mount, just on Matthew 6. I want to go through six very basic things. Now, we could peel this apart. In fact, Pastor Jeff, you could probably preach and teach on prayer for the next two years and not exhaust everything there is about prayer. I mean, there are heights and depths and things in prayer that a lot of you guys have been into that you just can't exhaust it. It's so diverse. It's so powerful. There's so much intimacy with the Father and with the Holy Spirit in prayer. So we're just going to give some basics and some practical things. I want you to lock into maybe one or two nuggets. Let the Lord show you something and then commit to that. Commit to what we're about to talk about. Say, I'm going to commit to this not just for a week or two. I want to commit to this for the next six months or the next year or two years and go from a one to a two or a three to a four or a seven to an eight. See, if you just try something for a week or two, you'd be like, oh, I, I didn't really see much improvement. I don't think this really works. Well, what if, what if you did that on your job or in your profession? What if you did that in business? How long does it take to, to, to have a successful business? How many seasons do you have to go through in your business to succeed? Anybody here want to give a... How, does it take more than a year? Okay, good. All right, we established that. So take, take something that God gives you this morning. It might just be one phrase. It might even be nothing that's coming out of my mouth. While you're sitting here, the Holy Spirit might whisper something to you as we're reading the scriptures. And you go, that's for me. I'm taking that. And I'm going to use that to go from a two to a three. 
over the next year. Why? Because if you're 21 in here and you can go from a 2 to a 3 this year and the next year from a 3 to a 4, by the time you get to the end of your 20s, you are going to have an effective life of prayer and things are going to begin to be transformed around you. Your life will be changed. People's lives around you will be changed and you will have a lasting eternal impact in your calling in the earth, wherever God puts you, if you can be effective in prayer. All right, but we have to grow. We have to grow in the skill of it. We have to persevere through the difficulties. So number one, for Matthew 6, the majority of prayer is directed to the Father. Now, that seems really simple, but I hear people pray all over the map. The vast majority of what we pray is to the Heavenly Father, and this is in the form of petition. Most of what we're doing when we pray is asking God asking him about things or for things. And we're going to talk about that more, but it's a good thing. So we're praying to the Heavenly Father. And number two, we pray in secret. I heard an author write it this way. The secret to praying is praying in secret. Why do we pray in secret? Well, it does a few things. It purifies my motives because if I'm praying for other people to notice me in public, I'm not going to want to pray much in private because I don't get the same thing. And so when I go to get alone with God, if there's any kind of motive in my heart that's off, it's going to come out in prayer. It's going to come out as boredom, distraction, anxiety, all kinds of different things. And you think, well, that, yeah, I kind of feel some of that. Good. That's what it's supposed to do. But don't quit. God's not surprised that we struggle in prayer. It purifies those motives When I pray in secret, I have to face the reality of what I actually believe about God and what I actually believe about how he sees me. When I pray in secret, I come face to face with what I really believe. Do I really believe that the invisible, transcendent God is listening to me? Do I really believe something is about to change because of what I'm doing right here? Do I believe that he sees me and loves me and wants to help me? See, that's all going to come out in secret prayer. And the third thing is that it reveals my level of trust. A little bit of trust equals a little bit of prayer. A lot of trust, big trust equals big prayer. What do I mean by little and big? I'm talking about frequency, frequency, how often we pray, and fervency, What's the urgency of my heart when I come to the place of prayer? If I have a little bit of trust in God, that's good. We want to have trust. Even if it's a little, we want to grow it. That's not a bad thing. But what you'll notice is you don't want to get alone with him as often. And when you do, there's not as much urgency on the inside of you. You're just you're trying to figure out how to do this thing. When you have big trust in God because you've been through some things, you want to get to that place a lot. And when you're there... You're doing business with God. And it's urgent because you have a sense of the priority of his heart for the people around you, for your own life, and what's happening in the earth. So as your trust increases, the urgency and the frequency of prayer increases. And that comes through history with God, okay? The third thing under Matthew 6, Jesus is teaching us is to pray really straightforward, trusting prayers with confidence. Now, how can we pray with confidence? And when I say straightforward, I mean simple. Conversational type prayer. A lot of people say, well, I don't know how to pray. I don't know what kind of words to use. Do you know how to talk to your spouse? Do you know how to talk to your kids? Do you know how to talk on the phone to a friend? Then you can talk with God. Okay, straightforward, trusting prayers with confidence. How can we be confident? Well, we pray, Jesus said, knowing that the Father knows what we need before we even ask. And you say, well, if he knows what I need before I ask, then why do I even need to ask? Well, we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. There's a reason why he says to ask, and it's really cool what we get to do and why he wants us to ask. But we have confidence That he knows what we need before we ask, and it's his good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Luke 12, 32 says it. Jesus told his disciples, it's my father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So when you go to prayer, when you go into your closet and get on the floor, when you kneel beside your bed, when you're in a quiet place walking through the woods or, or the neighborhood, and nobody's watching, you can be assured through the word of God, if you are righteous By believing in Jesus and you're cleansed by his blood, the Father has 
great pleasure in you. Look, my daughter doesn't even feel confident in prayer, but she's trying. I love this. Come on, let's do this. Keep coming, keep coming. You can be confident that that's his posture, not, hmm, maybe. And then Jesus also said that we can expect rewards. A lot, for a long time, I thought, you know, because Jesus here says he's going to reward you openly. For a long time, I thought that that meant, well, the things that people seek when they pray corporately and want people's approval, well, then God will do that without me having to strive for it. God will give me favor with people or God will do the, it's very, very simple. Or God will give me some big spiritual reward. It seemed kind of vague. What does it mean that God will reward you openly? Well, it's real simple. The very thing that you're praying for in secret, God's going to do it. I, I, I'm on my knees because I need breakthrough. God, I need breakthrough in my health. You know what I've been through. Or God, you've seen the infertility like Hannah. Year after year, she goes up to the temple to pray. And the frequency and the fervency, she's so desperate because she knows God wants to give her a baby, but she can't conceive and Eli, the priest, thinks she's drunk. She's that, fer- she's that lost. In her- and the Bible says in the bitterness of her own soul. Not that she was bitter against God, but it was, a, it was a bitter taste in her mouth that she couldn't conceive. But instead of gripe against God or gripe about God to someone else, she poured out what was in her heart before God. She brought it to him over. She refused to give up on this promise. And we... We, we get real religious, and when people say, you know what, it's the will of God, I'm going to move on, even though I know that God wants to, I, I believe he wanted to do this, but maybe something happened, and I'm just going to accept the will of God and be at peace. Oh, you're a big person. Hannah didn't want to be a big person. She wanted what God had promised her, and she wasn't going to let any religious person get in the way between her and the urgency of needing to conceive of what God was doing in the earth. Because through her came the prophet Samuel that changed the whole nation. It ended the drought, the Bible says, of the lack of the word of God in that day. So we can expect breakthrough. We can expect expect wisdom, provision, favor, strength. Whatever it is that we're asking for, we can expect that God will reward us. Now, it's the wisdom of God to reward us in his way and in his timing, right? God, I, I, need, I need this thing to happen. I need this promotion at work. I'm asking you because that's going to bring provision to my family. And you're laying it out there. You're asking, and he's totally pleased. He's like, son, I'm so glad you're asking for this. This is so good. I, the Bible says he can't wait to be gracious. He just waits to be gracious. And we're going to read that scripture in a second. And then he releases the answer, but God, that doesn't look like what I asked for. And that, it's a little late, but if you'll just trust him, you'll realize it's right on time. And everything he's trying to do, he's working it all out for your good. And when you get on the other side a year, two, three years later, sometimes it takes a little bit of time. For those of you who've, who've done it, you know what I'm talking about. You look back and go, oh, yeah, it's probably good it didn't happen the way I wanted it to because that would have really messed me up. My daughter, my four-year-old, she wants to drive my car. <laughs> she wants to. And I'm telling you, she could probably figure it out. Don, you know, you've been in class with her. Oh, Jesus. She, she's a force. I love it. A beautiful force. And God created her a certain way, and we're, we're working with it. But I'm not going to give her the keys to my car. But you know what? When Uncle Steve called and said, hey, I got this little plastic car with a battery in the back and just okay let's do that and then you have to walk beside her because she wants to like go off-roading and drive over ditches and you know run over her brothers so let's get good at the little plastic car first okay so um the fourth thing 
The majority of our prayer is directed to the Father in the form of petition. We pray in secret for lots of reasons. We pray straightforward, trusting prayers with confidence. And we pray knowing that the Father knows what we need before we ask. And we expect Him to move, to reward us, to to come through on what we're asking for in His way and timing. We expect breakthrough. Number five, I want to make a couple observations about specifically this starting in verse 9, the Lord's Prayer. If you read that, you'll notice half of the, of the text of that prayer is vertical. And the other half of that text is horizontal. What do I mean? 50% of the Lord's prayer is directed to God. It's ministering to his heart. And we'll look at that in a second. What does that look like? But I'm, I'm talking to him about him and about his priorities, his kingdom, his character, his nature. And it's God-directed. But the other 50% of the prayer is, I'm asking for personal needs. I'm asking for the needs of other people. Why is that important? It doesn't mean that, okay, okay, all my prayers have been said that uh, it's 50% this, 50% this, so I'm going to split up my prayer list and make sure that I'm half time here, half time. No, it's not about 50-50. It's about God knows that we need to, to look to him first, and then he cares about every need in our life. He cares about the people in our life. So he wants us to do this, and he also wants us to do this. That's really, really important because prayer's both. It's a concert of both vertical and horizontal uh, petition and prayer and conversation. Okay, I want to give you this. There's three words I would use to kind of sum up the posture of prayer in the Lord's Prayer. The first is adoration, or we adore the Father. We adore God. Second is we agree with him. And the third is we ask. So adore, it's, it's three A's. It makes it easy if you're taking notes. Just three A's. Adore, agree, and ask. Adore, agree, ask. It makes it very simple. First, we adore him. And this is where we're looking into who he is. And we're worshiping him. And we're telling him about him, his faithfulness. Why? Because we need to hear it. It doesn't... It doesn't change him when we do it. It does minister to him, and he takes pleasure in it. It does affect him. You know, God has emotions. Don't you love it when you're... Do you feel less loved because your two-year-old doesn't say, Daddy, I love you? Do you feel less loved? Do you get depressed because your two-year-old didn't say it? No, but don't you love it when they do? <laughs> you love it. It's like, oh, if, if they said it 50 times in a day, would it annoy you? If they said it a thousand times a day, would it annoy you? If your grandkids wanted to sit on your lap for 30 minutes and just tell you, you're so awesome. I love you. Would it, would, you would tell everybody else to get the heck away. Go on about your day. I'm sitting right here. Call in. I'm going to be late to work. I'm not mo- That's gold, right? We don't get that very often. We love it. The Father loves it when we adore him. We agree with him. So our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom, your priority, your agenda, your dominion. Come and your will be done in me as it is in heaven. All right? So the second part of this is agreement. God has a way. He has a timing. He has an agenda. And I want to get in full agreement with that. Did you know that the wisest thing you can do is agree with God? Well, God, I don't like how you're doing this. Okay. You can do it your way. You can, and I'll be right here. I'm going to walk with you the whole time. And when you slip and fall, I'm going to pick you up, and we're going to come back over here, and now let's, let's try this way. Well, I don't want to do it that way. I don't like it that way. That makes me feel like people don't appreciate me or whatever. Uh, okay. Totally up to you. Right? There's a way and a will and a timing of how God wants to do it. There's steps to it, and there's a process. How many don't like that dirty word, that P word, process? There's a process. Sometimes we get tired of that word. I've been in process. I'm still in process. What's up with this whole thing of process? Welcome to the human experiment. (laughs) Welcome to life on this earth. Before we graduate into glory, we are in a process. I'm really actually thankful for process. Because of what it creates or what comes out of process is beautiful. In Psalm 2, David says, kiss the sun. He's speaking to the kings of the earth, the rulers of the earth, the governors. Kiss the sun 
lest he be angry with you. In other words, what's he saying? Am I supposed to kiss Jesus? What does that that mean, kiss? It means be agreeable to the king because you don't want to be in disagreement with the king when he comes. Right? You don't want to be in disagreement with Jesus. You don't want to be stiffening your neck and arching your back and walking this way when he comes. You don't want to do that even in this life. We want to kiss him, meaning we want to agree with him and say, yes, Jesus, yes to your way, yes to your timing, yes to your kingdom. However you want to do this and work this out in me, I'm, come on, let's do it. It's really hard. I don't like it. He's like, I know you don't like it, but I promise, just stick with it. The peaceable fruit of righteousness is coming. But God, I don't want righteousness. I want this thing. I know you do, but if, you, if I give you this thing now, it will ruin you. Because if I give it to you now, I have to hold you responsible for what I give you. And you're not ready for that responsibility. See, he cares. We do the same thing with our kids. And then we ask. We ask for provision. We ask for forgiveness. And we forgive others. We ask for deliverance from temptation, from the evil one, for justice, for the oppressed, all kinds of things. And he wants us to ask. Okay, that's number five. And number six, moving on past the Lord's prayer then. Basically what he's saying here is you want to pray with a clear conscience. Pray with a clear conscience. There's lots of other places in Scripture where we're, it, it says, hey, look, you come to worship or you come to pray, you come to minister to the Lord, and you're convicted all of a sudden by the Holy Spirit that there's some problem with a brother or a sister or a family member. Leave, leave that place and go make it right. If 10 of you got up right now and walked out of this room to go make it right, that would be appropriate. It's, it's better to do that, interrupt the service, leave. Where, where, are you, where are you going? I have to go make this right. Yes, Absolutely. Everything stops. Why? Because bitterness in the heart blocks prayer. It does. Unforgiveness, the Bible says right here, Jesus said there's a consequence for unforgiveness. And it's that if you are unwilling to to release someone and forgive them, the Father cannot release you and forgive you. Well, that's not loving, that's not kind. How many of you want to reward your kids for bad behavior? Do you want to, re- what do we call that? When you reward people for, yeah, what is it? Negative, Negative reinforcement. There's the technical term. God's not a bad father. He's really, really good. And he's waiting to be gracious. Son, daughter, just release it. Release it so that I can whoo, come on in and release you. Okay, so a couple other scriptures on this one just to back it up. Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2.8, I I want everybody to to lift up holy hands free from wrath and dissension, meaning if there's anger in your heart or wrath in your heart or dissension, James 3 talks about, the end of James 3 talks about dissension in the church, gossip, slander, comparison, Talking about people, running them down behind their back. Or being disagreeable. It's okay to disagree. But to just have a posture of always being disagreeable with leadership or with people in your life that have authority or people that have influence with you. To always have dissension because you have to have your way or you just, maybe there's some old stuff going on and it's just, ugh, I'm just annoyed, I'm frustrated. Okay? If I carry that in my heart and I lift up my hands, I'm not free. And it hinders the worship. It hinders the prayer. Um, And Paul wanted the the people of God to be free from wrath and dissension, meaning repent of it. Make it right. Matthew, uh, here in Matthew 6, God wants us to be free from offense and unforgiveness. And then in 1 Peter 3, 7, Peter teaches the people of God, especially husbands, look, if you're harsh with your wife, If you're hard on her and demanding and you're frustrated with her and you're always kind of bringing down, it's actually going to hinder your prayers. He's very clear. Your prayers will be hindered. What is he saying? You need to go and figure out how to walk in love with this woman. You need to figure out how to walk in love. Well, she's this, she's that, she's doing this, she's doing that, da, 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 da. For years... I struggled because my wife has a very different value of time than I do. 
Anybody know what I'm talking about? (laughs) She is what we call a lingerer. She lingers. She loves to linger. She loves to just be with people. Baby, it's, it's like we, we got to go. Kids are screaming. Da, 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 da. We, they haven't eaten. We got to get... Tra- what? What time is it? Oh. Oh, okay. And then it's like 15 minutes later. Come on, baby. Come on. Yeah, the other day, I said to my boys, don't, don't stone me. I said, all right, guys, come here. Here's the deal. I will pay each of you, or whoever can do it first, a dollar if you can get your mom to the car. What? Money? (laughs) Come on, mom. (laughs) Now, we, we laugh about it. We joke about it. And what has happened over the years is it softened me to realize I'm, I'm in a hurry. I value efficiency over relationship sometimes. And, a, and getting to a goal rather than helping other people get there on the same page. And actually what happened was as I became more sensitive to my wife and, and set it up for success, meaning, you know what? I'm not going to commit to being anywhere with the kids. Dad, what are we going to do next? I don't know. You'll know when we get there. Because I don't know when we're going to get there. <laughs> and it's good. It's all good. Just chill out. I'm chilling out. See me? Here's what I learned. I learned how to wait on the Holy Spirit, even in this kind of a setting, because I learned how to wait with my wife. Well, that went over like a lead brick. <laughs> Learning how to walk with her not only taught me about how the Holy Spirit moves and works, but it also softened me and allowed me to see there's, there's different values other than my values. There's things that are important to the heart of God that I haven't elevated yet and seen as a priority. And those things had to get, (laughs) the chisel had to come in. The Hebrew word for character is a chisel on stone. (laughs) And my backside has seen the chisel of God. Chiseling out some things through hardship. And what I learned was as I began to love my wife more, And husbands and wives, this goes both ways. Because wives can be really hard on husbands too. We can do that to each other, right? We get into dissension and strife, but guess what? Prayer is hindered. You get into your prayer closet and all of a sudden you're like, well, God, you need to convict her. God, just convict her of this value that time is valuable and it matters when you... And God's going, what? What? It's hindered. I can't get into the flow of the Spirit. I can't even get into a place of confidence. I can't get into the heart of God because there's this thing in me, and I've got to go make it right. And sometimes it's not just making it right. Baby, I'm really, really sorry. And sometimes I tell my kids, I'm really glad that you said you're sorry, but what's more valuable to me is that now for the rest of the day, show me. Just show me through your behavior. Show me through the posture of your heart. You actually truly mean it and do it differently. Let's learn to do it differently. And so I have to walk through that process. So prayer has to happen with a clear conscience. If it's not clear, let's make it right. All right? What is prayer? We'll talk about what prayer is for a second. It's simply talking to God, but there's five major expressions of prayer. And when you know these expressions, it's like widening the colors on your palate. So that you can dip into different colors. And prayer is extremely creative. It flows. It can be spontaneous. It's a beautiful thing. And I want to give you these five major expressions of prayer. Because you can use them in lots of different ways. To go vertical. To pray for other people. To ask for your needs. But all in the context of. And if you think about your own life for a second. Your life of prayer. There's the kind of prayer that is spontaneous. And then there's the kind of prayer that's scheduled. And both are really, really important. And you need to understand this. Many of you do. But if you're new to this, understand that there's, there's the kind of prayer that a lot of times even unsaved people are doing. God, if you'll just get me out of this jam, I promise I'll repent and make it right and serve you the rest of my life. How many of you ever made that promise to God when you were... Okay, that is a spontaneous prayer. Heat was applied to your backside and all of a sudden you were like, "Woo, God help me. That's spontaneous prayer. We pray throughout the day. Paul said pray at all times. 
all kinds of different ways. Pray for God's people, pray in the spirit, do all these kinds. We pray throughout our day. We want to interact with him. It's how I am with my kids and my wife and my family and my friends. I interact with them all throughout the day, right? We're, we're 30 second prayers, 60 second prayers. One of the hardest things I've had as a leader over the this last couple decades in the body of Christ is to try to get people to understand that prayer is not just going into a quiet place for four hours and being really, really religious or crying out and groaning for breakthrough for something. And people say, well, I can't pray because I don't have enough time to pray. I don't have an hour. You, don't, you need 30 seconds. You might need five seconds to pray. That's a type of prayer, and it's just as valuable. God takes just as much pleasure in it And he loves it, and he'll reward it just the same. He doesn't weigh one against the other. Well, you're praying lots of short prayers, but you're not praying the long ones, so I'm just done. (laughs) Some of the greatest breakthroughs in my life came in five to ten seconds in those moments. How many of you were saved in a moment? You didn't have to travail for hours and hours and hours. Now, maybe, maybe some of you did because what was in you was so dark and so deep, you had to truly be broken. That might be. It doesn't, it's not a formula. But there's spontaneous prayers. But there's also, and this is really important, and those of you that are new to this, you, it, scheduled prayer is really, really important. Time that you set aside and say, I'm going to take 30 minutes or I'm going to take an hour or two hours or I'm going to take 15 specific at this time of the day and I'm going to schedule it and I'm going to go deep and I'm going to have a purpose. I'm going to have something specific that I'm going for in that prayer. That's a really, really important kind of prayer and both are necessary in our daily life. And as we do it, we develop a life of prayer. Now, there's a difference between a prayer life, meaning I pray sometimes, And prayer, I kind of have to fit it in to my daily life and my routine. And then there's a life of prayer. Mario Murillo talks about this. There's a life of prayer where prayer is so ongoing with God that life actually gets in the way of my prayer with him. So in one, I'm trying to fit prayer into my busy life. In the other, I'm trying to fit other people and life into my busy prayer life. It's very, very different, okay? What we want to go for, what we're growing towards is a life of prayer, an ongoing conversation, both spontaneous and planned, things that seem kind of shallow and we throw out there that God hears and he answers, and times that we go really, really deep and we're really focused and we have goals with God and we want to get to a place with him. There's things that we're contending for and we're going to keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. And both are really, really critical. We don't want to be light on either one of those, all right? And so it's a skill. It's something we develop over time. Five types of prayer, all right? Petition, that's the most common type. That's when we're asking for basic needs for ourselves. Okay, petition is different than intercession because when I'm interceding, I'm not asking for me. I'm asking on behalf of someone else. So when you're asking for someone else, it's intercession. When you're asking for yourself, it's petition, And both are really, really important. A lot of prayer is self-focused. I learned this later in my life of prayer. As I developed with the Lord, I learned, why why isn't he responding to me this? Why don't I feel his presence the same in this season? And slowly the Holy Spirit began to show me. He was very gentle. He said, Ben, all you're doing is focusing on you. All the things that you think that you want and need. But you haven't talked to me about me. You're not asking about anybody else. You're just focused on you. Oh, oh yeah, I, I, I sure am. And I begin to focus on things that were on his heart and on him. And all of a sudden, came alive again. God began to answer prayers for people, and he began to show me things about himself. And my world expanded beyond me. All right? Really, really important. Petition and intercession. Thanksgiving. This is where we recount God's faithfulness. And what he's done of protection, provision, deliverance. You know, this last week, one of the things that I committed to was to take this first week. And the second week, it's a different focus. But this first week, part of my scheduled prayer time every day is, okay, I'm going to focus on the name of God, Jehovah Jireh. The Lord is my provider. He provides. He is my provision. He's more than enough. And I'm going to limit it to this last year. 
What has God done in this last year to provide for me and my family and the stories of the people around me where I've seen his provision? And then I begin to thank him for it and recount it to him and tell him the story of what he did. Why? Because he needs to remember it? No, because I need to remember it and my heart needs to, to, to go to this place of soft thankfulness and remember what he's done. Why? So all of a sudden, it starts to energize my heart for what's next. Wait, wait, wait. Yep, I'm building my faith up. God, you can do this next thing. It's, it's bigger. There's more. But I know, I know not only can you do it, but you will do it because you've done it before. And it's thankfulness. I've targeted, scheduled prayer with a focus of thankfulness. In fact, I would suggest coming to the Father uh, usually first with thanksgiving. We enter his courts with thanksgiving, or enter his, his gates of thanksgiving, his courts with praise. David said that in the Psalms. It's one of the first things we do is we go upward, we go vertical, we say, God, you're awesome. I love you. First thing in the morning, you wake up. Oh, Lord, your mercies are new every morning. I'm not who I was yesterday. I'm who you say I am today. And I give you glory. Thank you. Thank you for being with me through the night. And you just begin to thank him. Tell him who he is. That's the way we approach the king. We focus on him first. All right, the fourth thing. So there's petition, intercession, thanksgiving. Um, and I'll say this. When your heart is postured right before the Lord, these things blend together. So I was, in a, I was actually in a prayer meeting with our staff back in Pensacola. This was a few years ago. And one of the, past, one of the other pastors was reading a, a specific passage and he was talking about some stuff, and, and we were kind of doing a devotional. We were praying together as a staff. And it's not that I wasn't listening, but as I was sitting there, and I was just being, just being in the presence of God with our team, all of a sudden, this scripture goes across my mind, and it's that scripture out of Psalm 3420, where it, it's talking about the Messiah, and in his death, that none of his bones were broken. You guys know that scripture? And I just, that that. I was just, actually, I think I was flipping through. I just flipped it open to the Psalms while, this, while somebody was talking, and I just saw it in my eyes, and the scripture went through my mind, and all of a sudden, a picture of my son's face, my middle son John's face, came up just in my imagination. And that fast, the Holy Spirit said, pray right now that none of his bones will be broken. I'm like, okay. Well, I know enough to know over the years of having boys that what that actually means, something's about to happen, and the Lord's giving me a chance to intercede first and prepare the way for protection. Isn't God good? But see, I was available. I wasn't on my knees. I wasn't fasting. I wasn't like laying out hours before him, but because he's a good friend and he's got my back and he's got your back, he just goes, hey, do this, because he's always promised us to be a provider, to safeguard us, to keep us, Psalm 91. So he shows me my son's face, and I said, I, this simple. I didn't go into travail. I didn't raise my hand and say, hey, guys, can you all pray for my son right now? I literally said it this simple. Father, I agree with your word, and I pray that none of his bones will be broken. <laughs> and then I moved on. Weren't you nervous? Weren't you, didn't you call home and ask what's going on? No. Why? Because if the father said, pray that none of his bones will be broken, then none of his bones are going to be broken. Right? right. Yay! I can move on with my day and trust that my covenant partner has got my back at home. That's the big trust. I just big trust and move on with my day. I honestly forgot about it. I got home that night and it dawned on me, I wonder if John's going to come running up to me. Sure enough, come through the door. Bup, 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 bup. Yep, that's John. Here comes John around the corner. Dad, you're not going to believe it. I almost like got totally wrecked today. He fell off this thing going downhill. It's this ripstick. It's like a skateboard, but it's funky, and I don't ever get on one because I would kill myself. <laughs> but it's like your back leg, and he's going downhill, and he's trying to do something cool for his brothers and touch this car as he's going, and, eh, <laughs> and he's being kind of, you know. And he hits a rock or a crack in the pavement, and he's going really fast, and boom, and he just flies face first down on the asphalt. And Katie was watching. She said instantly before he even hit, all the adrenaline in my body, and I thought, we're going to the ICU. <laughs> like we're, or not ICU, but we're going to the emergency room. Because he's going to break his nose, break his face, have all kinds of... He hits face first, bam, on the pavement. And he lays there for a second, 
And then he pops up, and there wasn't a scratch on him. There was no rash from the asphalt going that fast, and his face never hit the pavement. There was no scratches on his hands. And he got up, and he was like, <laughs> like this. And Katie's like, waiting, just waiting. You know how there's always like a two-second pause in trauma, and then it's like, the, Wah! nothing. And he goes, Dad, I literally think like an angel was underneath me because I should have broken my nose and knocked teeth out. He said, I didn't even have a, look, look at my shirt. There's not even a scratch. Five seconds. That's all it took, five seconds. All right? That was the first time we had to do that. The second time, I had a picture of him on the trampoline. And the Lord said, uh, pray that I will preserve his life. Oh, God. Now, Lord, preserve his life in Jesus' name. I was actually going to the bathroom. I was headed to the, some of the best prayers happen on the way to the bathroom. I'm headed to the bathroom. I'm not thinking about anything. I'm just like, Lord, you're good. I see John. I see him on the trampoline. Pray that I'll preserve his life. Come home to realize that he was doing multiple backflips or front flips, something in a row. He got to like a dozen and lost his sense of whatever. He was doing too many, and he told me, I knew I was doing too many in a row. And he fell on his head, and his neck went like this. And Luke was so freaked out by seeing it, thought he had broken his neck because when he came down, he just laid there. And Luke ran inside screaming, Mom, Mom, get out of here. John broke his neck. Ah, bloody murder, right? So Katie's like, oh, my God, my son's dead. She comes out, and he's getting up like, oh. And he was fine. He was fine. But he should have broken his neck. We didn't keep the trampoline. <laughs> I mean, I trust God, but I also don't trust trampolines. But I do trust the Father. That was the second time. Intercession. So petition, thanksgiving, intercession. And then the, the fourth is intimacy. These are expressions of love and adoration and awe. God, you're so good. I love you. You're so patient with me. You've been so faithful to my family. And then the last one I wrote down is tongues. And there's more than this, but these are five really uh, uh, major expressions of prayer, and all of them can be used in your prayer time. And then tongues. This is an evidence or result of the baptism or infilling of the Holy Spirit. began in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. And it's praying in a heavenly language that you did not learn with your intellect, specifically by the Spirit's inspiration. E Ephesians 6.18, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Romans 8.26, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that can't be expressed in words. And in the next verse, verse 27, it says that he prays the will of God over our life when we pray in the Spirit. And then in Jude, verse 20 and 21, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. Praying in the Holy Spirit, we pray the will of God. It's not a, a language that we learn, but it's prayed because of the, of the overflow of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And it's got a very specific purpose when done personally. We build ourselves up in our faith. We keep ourselves in the love of God, and we're able to pray the will of God. You say, I, I don't even know what to pray right now. I don't even know what God wants. I'm not even sure what to ask for. Then get on your face and pray in the Holy Spirit. Because he knows exactly what to ask for. He knows the mind of God. He searches our heart and he searches the mind of God and he knows exactly how to connect the two. There have been times that I'm praying and I'm praying in the Holy Spirit and circumstances are so intense. The pressure is so intense. I remember a season of ministry that was so we, I mean, it was so phenomenally intense. I was going to Walmart with a couple of my sons, and I literally had a, I broke down, and I had to go sit on the bench, and I just wept. And John was like, Dad, you okay? You all right? It's okay, John. I had the, the sense of the goodness of God on my heart. I knew everything was okay. But you ever, you know what I'm talking about? When the pressure of life and people and your own inabilities meeting impossible tasks and you don't even know what to do, and you're not going to cave to fear, but you know the goodness of God, but you're right in the squeeze. And I just began to weep, and all I could do was breathe. And then we get into Walmart, and I'm trying to buy stuff, and we get to the bread aisle, and I break down again. 
I just totally break down. And I've had, I've had times like that in my marriage and in my life with my kids and in ministry and just in business, being a, uh, just an entrepreneur, just doing little small things. Times when the finances, I mean, there's times that Katie and I almost got evicted. There's times when it's so, and you just can see yourself shuffling along the street, pushing a cart homeless with your wife. And she's like, why did I marry you? I thought I was hooking my wagon to a star. <laughs> a falling star. <laughs> hey, Lord, I need an upgrade. And it's like you're in the press and you're not enough. And the anxiety is pressing in. And then all you can do is just begin to pray in the spirit. God, and just weep. And, just, and sometimes you groan. You know, when my wife had a, a mask on her face, Jack had crowned. He, she was giving birth to our first son. He had crowned, and the doctor did this. Hmm. And he took two fingers, and he pushed Jack about a foot back in. And my wife was like, oh. No, no medicine, no anesthesia, no nothing. She really wanted to have a natural birth. And back goes Jack, and he says, you know what? We're going to wait. Put everything down, put everything back, turn the lights off, and went. And said, I'll be back in two hours. She had to wear, so she's there in that state. <laughs> Her body just wants to give birth and push. And she's got to not push for two hours and wear an oxygen mask. Well, if you know anything about my wife, she doesn't want any, anybody within about 10 feet of her when she goes to bed. She's like, I need space. <laughs> I don't know if she was locked in a small cabinet as a kid. We're trying to get to the root of where this is. But she needs her space. And so the doctor's like, here, be covered in a blanket in the dark with people around you, your body freaking out, and now wear this thing over your face. And she's sitting there, and I can see it in her face. And I thought, oh, my gosh, she looks like she's about to die. And so after about two hours, I go and throw a fit on all the nursing staff, and I'm banging on stuff. Get the doctor in here. Wow, he's having coffee down in the cafe. <laughs> what? <laughs> Come to find out, he was delivering another baby who wasn't drinking coffee in the cafe. And what he did saved her life and Jack's life. They both would have died had he not done that. But she's in this place, and you know what was coming out of her? Praise God it wasn't what would have come out of me. What was coming out of her was, oh, oh. And you know, there's times in your life when you're trying to birth something, and God says, hold on, wait a second. You're like, oh, God, I can't. Oh, God, this is more than I can bear, and all I can do is just sit here and groan. And the Holy Spirit will groan through you, and the Father will take great pleasure in your life. When you're at your weakest, when you're at your worst, when you feel like you have failed, if all you can do is groan or just breathe out and breathe in, the Father will take pleasure in you, and he will hear the cry of your heart because that's prayer. I know we need to wrap it up. We're on page one. Of three. <laughs> I want you guys to stand up. <laughs> Carolyn, I don't know if you want to come. Yeah. You know, I work with the, with the children's department, so I know what they're going through right now. <laughs> Mr. Sam is over there watching one of my kids. And I have compassion and mercy on Mr. Sam right now. <laughs> so we're not going to go too long. How many of you found just one thing you can sink your teeth into and take a hold of and take it to the next level? Just one thing, okay? Well, here's what I want you to do. Close your eyes. I want you to have that one thing in your spirit. See it. See yourself doing that. See yourself walking in that for the next six months, the next 12 months, and increasing in that one thing. Just have it right there suspended in your spirit, man. Now I want you to talk to God about it. Say, Father... I want to be more thankful. I want to increase in thanksgiving. I want to increase in my ability to recount your faithfulness. Or, God, I want to be able to pray in this, remember to pray in the Spirit. I want to remember to be able to pray in the Spirit as I go through my day spontaneously, not just in my prayer closet, but I want to do my day with you more and more. Or maybe you're saying, I don't even really pray much, maybe five minutes a day, but I want to go 15 minutes. I want to go 20 minutes. 
I get bored, but I, I want to get past the boredom and I want to get into the more of God. There's a whole lot more that we can say about prayer. We're just touching the very, very, very tip of the iceberg. But get that thing in your spirit. Or maybe it's something the Holy Spirit showed you while you were sitting here that I never even said. That probably, likely, that's what it is. Father, right now we, we ask you to put your power behind it. Not our strength, our striving, our ability, but your grace so that you get glory. Father, we ask you to increase us on the inside by a spirit of revelation and a spirit of steadfastness, of faithfulness to stay in this thing. Now, if you're in here and you have a sense of, man, I've just kind of failed. I've not lived up to what my commitment was. We're six, seven days in and, and I'm just not, I'm not batting a thousand here. I'm not doing well. If that's you, I just want you to tell the Father. Just simply tell Him right now. We're a house of prayer. We talk to the Father about everything. This is what we do. This is how we partner with God and His purposes is we talk to Him and we ask Him. And then He does things because we're His kids and it's inheritance. We don't earn it. We ask and He gives. That's for His glory. And it proves that we're the children of God because we ask. The Father said to Jesus in Psalm 2, Ask and I'll give you the nations. Even Jesus had to ask. Just ask him. Say, say Father, I've, I've failed, but I know that you're faithful. And your word says that when I'm faithless, you remain faithful because you can't deny yourself. Father, I want to grow in this thing, and I want to get past my own failures. I want to get into your grace. Help me to be faithful. Show me what this means. Show me why I failed. And show me how to just rely on you and just persevere through this. And I just heard this phrase. I heard the Father say this to someone. You're not failing. You're growing. (laughs) You just need to take that. It's almost like the enemy has tried to put this label on you of failure. Everything I try to do, I'm just not that good at it. And the Father says, no, you've just been growing. You're practicing. You're taking steps. And I'm really, really happy about it. Keep taking steps because you're going to get there. Oh, would, you just do, would you just join the hand of your neighbor right now? Just, just join their hand. I want you to just pray for them. And here's what we're going to pray. Over these next couple weeks, Father, we ask that you would do what we cannot do. Just pray for the person on your left, on your right. If there's somebody only on your left, just pray for them. Ask for them what you would be asking for yourself. God, give breakthrough. God, increase them in revelation. God, be faithful. Bring them into your faithfulness. God, I ask for more understanding of prayer and fasting and that you would take any heaviness off of them. That they would succeed in the place of prayer and get a hold of your heart. Father, we ask you to take us to new heights in the spirit, new revelation, and new depths of your love, new depths of your heart for other people and for our city, for the lost, for our families, for our children. God, meet us in the night with dreams. Meet us in the daytime with words and whispers and vision and understanding and wisdom. Father, you hear the cry of our heart and you answer because we're yours. We're your children and this is what you delight in. You delight in your ambassadors, your children in the earth, asking of you so that you can then respond and give it. And we want to stay in this place of relationship with you of asking and then seeing you do mighty things. God, we love you. We give you praise and glory and honor in the mighty name of Jesus.